At some point, all of us reach a point of burnout. Sometimes all it takes is a couple of days of rest or better yet a two-week vacation to recharge. But a career in interior design can be all-encompassing and the stress is felt round the clock. Okay. When clients are being overly demanding, when deliveries are screwed up, when your contractor disappears, how do you manage to nurture your creativity and apply a keen and critical eye to your work? Do you hire more administrative staff so you can focus on design? Or will the pressure of having to pay out yet more salaries only freak you out even more? Do you dare to take on other creative projects that might inspire you? Designing fabrics or fireplaces, opening a retail shop, or even publishing a book? Or will that only bring you closer to a breakdown? I'm lucky to have with me today three designers who have navigated all these issues and still managed to thrive. First up is Houston-based designer Nina Megan. Nina is known for her Luke's glam, moody, and frankly, sexy rooms. Her work has been featured in Architectural Digest, El Decor, and Interior Design Magazine, among others. She's currently developing and designing an array of items, including furniture, lighting, and rugs for Cosentino, Studio M, and Universal Furniture, and, reach a, and recently launched an exclusive collection of accessories with Bergdorf Goodman. Her first book, Evoke, will be published this fall by Monticelli Press. Welcome, Nina. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> so glad you're here. Liz Kahn established her Newton, Massachusetts firm in 2005. And since then, her colorful, charming, and sometimes even cheeky updates of New England traditional design have won her a host of fans. Beautifully layered and always comfortable, her interiors merge formality with relaxed luxury and are always extremely cosseting. Her work has been featured in El Decor, The New York Times, and Traditional Home, and she's currently working on her first book. Hello, Liz. Hi, Michael. After graduating from Indiana University and moving to New York City, Raymond Boozer initially became known for his quirky, charming, and youthful home store, Apartment 48. Now, under the same name, his firm designs apartments, lofts, offices, and stores that combine vibrant colors, exotic materials, and contemporary furnishings in spaces that feel optimistic, relaxed, and effortless. Apartment 48's work has been featured in Architectural Digest, House Beautiful, and New York Magazine. And Raymond is on the AD100 and the El Decor A-list. Welcome, Raymond. Hi, thanks, Michael. So, you guys, I'm, I have to say, reading your bios of all of you, I was like overwhelmed. I don't know how you do it. Um, the three of you are have stellar careers, and I, but I know it's not always easy. So, like, Nina, let's start with you. You have branched out in the last few years to doing so many things. How have you managed to do that without losing track of your creativity? Have you ever ha reached a point where you thought, oh, my God, I can't do this anymore? It's all the time. <laughs> <laughs> every day. <laughs> okay. So, well, if it's an everyday event, I guess it's like we don't yeah. need to discuss it that much. No, but seriously. Yeah. So I think that, um, you know, being a designer and trying to grow a business at the same time are two very conflicting things. Um, you know, I had to make a decision that I want to grow my business. And so I had to take a step back from the creativity a little bit and put people in charge of my office who can, like, for, for instance, assigning a creative director, assigning a managing director who I trust, who know my vision, who've been with me for a certain number of years. Um, because I had to make the choice, do I want to grow the business or do I want to stay small and be picking every single thread and every single button and things like that. And so I think at some point you have to make that decision do you want to go big or do you want to stay smaller? And, you know, I decided I want to go bigger. And so obviously there's still a lot of creativity involved in it, but I feel like now I've become, I'm the, in the business of creative, of the creative side, um, rather than, you know, the one who's selecting every single detail. Right. And Raymond, what about you? Um, was it something, because you started out in retail yeah. and doing design on the side. So when you made that switch, what motivated that? I think I burned out on retail. I burned out on it, just like uh -huh. I can burn out in design. I mean, design is my passion, and I do agree with Nina about like growing a business, you have to make a choice. But I think I'm not ready to give up the fun part of it, which is the creative part. So I delegate a lot of things, but the part where you're 
conceptualizing and like planning and like scheming about what everything's going to look like, I still want to be able to control that. So I think with a retail store, it was really hard to split my attention between the two. And I just decided that the retail store should just go and I should focus on design because that's really what I love, you know? Right. And how many years ago was that? That that was 13 years ago. Right. And have you ever regretted it? No, not at all. Okay. I think that the store served this purpose. It definitely gave me a platform and people know who I am now. And I like the idea of having a store, but the day to day was just too much. I think that interior design, you work one on one with people versus working with the entire general public. So it's a lot more like specific. And I like the idea of like being able to like have Saturday and Sunday off, which right. I never had before. Oh, a bit of a life. That's yeah. asking a lot. It's definitely asking a lot. Now, Liz, how about you? I mean, because you, your work is very, particularly you. All of you, are, that applies for all three of you. You each have a very distinctive style. But do you find that you, sometimes it's just too much and you need to delegate? Is it hard for you to delegate? How, how do you approach that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I I still like, Raymond, I'm very in control of the creative coming out of our office. Um, so that's one thing. I did have a retail store as well. Um, closed that about seven or eight years ago. I just sort of felt like it was, uh, I was kind of, it was burning me out, honestly. And I think that was part of it. I wanted my weekends back. But I try to really, I think like Nina said, separate myself. So I carve out times to be creative and I block out my calendar so nobody can schedule anything for me. And I have staff, obviously, now that, take care of the operations, um, all the logistics, all that kind of stuff. I'm not really involved in any of that anymore. Sometimes I don't. I just sort of show up after the creative's done. You know, there's a few meetings in between, but I kind of show up at the installation or when it's finished. So it's it's nice to finally have gotten to that point. So I control the creative, but I don't control the the project management. I have right, other people do that. Mm-hmm, the process, right. which is... Right. Great, it just, it's draining, so. Right. So right. I'd love to get a sense from each of you. Nina, why don't we start with you? Like, how big is your team? And what do you, who do you, who or what, what positions do you feel were the most important hires that sort of liberated you to be more creative? So I have 22 people on my team. Um, That's between, a big team. Yeah, between Houston and San Francisco. So we have the majority of them in Houston, and then we have three of them in San Francisco because we just recently opened over there. And so I think it was very critical that the girl who was running the San Francisco office, she worked under me for two years before she moved to San Fran. And then obviously assigning my creative director and assigning my managing director because I'm actually a double economics and finance major who then went into interior design because I loved the creative side. And so I realized very early on that I need to assign someone to help me do the design process. So I still do all the creative direction for all the process, Mm -hmm. for all the projects, but now she takes it from there. Once I give the direction, she handles it from there. And then I needed somebody who understands how to run a business to help me make sure that the projects are running on time, um, that we're not losing money, because obviously in design and you're working working with the creative people in your office, they want to keep on designing and redesigning and redesigning Mm -hmm. (laughs) without really paying attention to the time. So I had to hire a managing director who's going to basically monitor them. And that's kind of how we structured to grow. Yeah. Crack the whip a little bit saying enough with this chair. Exactly. It's perfect as it is, right. Well, that gave me the freedom to go out and start doing licensing Right, which was right. very important for the brand. Uh-huh. Right, and Raymond, well, how about how big is your team? Yeah, we have five people, so nothing as elaborate as Nina's. But mm-hmm. I think the most important thing is to have a design director. You know, I have someone who does basically everything. You know, I call myself the idea person, so I think of ideas or I decide what's going to be the idea, what's going to be the color scheme. And then I kind of let go of it. Like I start every project, I sketch everything. I still sketch everything. Mm -hmm. And then I just like hand it off, you know, and then it just happens. And I don't show up at the end. I mean, I'm there the whole time. Of course. I 
I think it's really important for me to let go of control of a lot of the decisions because like you're talking burnout, you know, I get super burned out when I decide I love something and then the client doesn't. And then I refuse to go back two, three times to do it again. I just get really, really frustrated if I have to like make a third or like a less good choice, you know, then it's just over for me. So for me to like let myself out of that, like have somebody else do it. You know, that made a huge difference for me and it helps me not get so frustrated, especially during COVID when things were taking so long. And, right. Oh my God, I've already chosen that. You know, like, when's it going to come? You know, but um, I think also the big thing for me is like when I had my store, I didn't have a business manager, a business manager. So having somebody who does all the financials and stuff makes a huge difference for me because I never like dealing with that. I never like doing like quarterly taxes and things like that. And having a business manager do all the financial stuff just takes it out of my hands. Yeah. Because I, I think one of the hard things about being a designer is, A, it is a business, but you went into it because you love design. So, yeah. Liz, do you, do you have that position, that number two person, that creative person that you look to? Or do you still do that yourself? Do you have a business manager? How does it work? How big is your team? We're um, we're six people in total. So I have mm-hmm. I do have um, a design director who works very closely with me and helps me manage the staff. And then we have a full time like kind of office manager, studio manager who manages the office and keeps everyone happy and does all the HR and you know payroll and bills and all those types of things. And then um, we have project managers under there, and we have a procurement person who just does all of our procurement and expediting. That's all they do all day long and. We um, we found that was a good, a great position to take away from the general project managers. It just gave us better buying power. It, there's, it's a different skill set. And I feel like mm-hmm. most designers, it's not their strength. So it's better to, for me, for me, it was better to take that off the plate. So yes. And then I outsource. Sometimes I do, I do have a, a business manager who comes in and quarterly I meet with him and we just go through the numbers and, you know, all the stuff that. I don't love to do, but I know I have mm-hmm. to do it. So <laughs> we stay on top of it. Right, right. Now, Liz, I'd love to ask you, was it hard for you to find a person, in terms of the create, creative side, you know, design director that you trusted? Was, it, was that a difficult position to, to fill? Um, yeah, I, it was a difficult position, but I also feel like it was, it kind of happened and it sort of was developing over, you know, some time. So most of the staff I've had for, um, I think the newest person's been here for three three years. So we've we've been here for a while together. So yeah, he's been here for, um, I don't know, I think this is his sixth or seventh year. So it's kind of been a nice, um, he's had a lot of time to sort of understand and know what we're doing. And, you know, also as a creative firm, like I feel like you're always evolving, right? And trying to mm-hmm. do things better and do things differently. And so he's been, a, he knows, he knows that that's, how it goes, you know, you're, we're going to evolve and we're going to change and he's along for the ride, which is great. But yeah, it's difficult. It's hard to find anybody right now. Anybody. And what yeah. about you, Raymond? I agree with Liz. I, this kind of business, it evolves, you know, for a long time, for like five years straight, we were like strictly corporate design and we did a lot of tech companies and we're known mm-hmm. for that. And so we just got more and more and more tech corporate jobs. But now after COVID, there are like no projects like that. You know, we're doing like all residential. Yeah, offices have disappeared. So we have to shift everything that we think about and the way that we structure things and the way that we shop and the and the actual sources where we get things. Because now we're doing residential and we're doing a lot of houses and townhouses and things like that. And it's a different customer. It works at a different pace. It's much slower, you know, which can be super frustrating too. But it's also a lot more creative in like some ways. Right, right. And Nina, I mean, you have diversified, shall we say. So, I mean, the brain, the the lighting collection that you do, all of that. At what point did you really feel, because I, I mean, I'm not a designer, but I have a feeling that if I were a designer and was doing well, and then somebody said, oh, I want you to design fabric, I want you to design lighting, I think I'd go through a bit of a freak out. Was that what happened with you? How did you feel confident enough to move ahead? Was it that you hadn't found new staff? How, how was it? Because it's scary. 
Yeah, no, it is very scary. And so, you know, I think it was a progression with time because we actually started in luxury residential. Then we went to commercial. Then we went to hospitality. And, you know, at some point I realized that I don't want to be just a design firm anymore. I want to be more of a brand. And so to become a brand, I had to step into licensing. And so the first licensing deal that ever came to me was Universal Furniture. And they had asked me, hey, would you be interested in designing a collection with us? And And that kind of propelled the idea of licensing more and, you know, spreading the brand awareness faster than I could do just with my design firm. Right. But did did you hesitate or were you ready? You know, I've never, I don't really hesitate. I think that... Plunge your head. Mm. (laughs) Things come to me when they're supposed to come to me. And if I don't know how to do something, I'm pretty good at, you know, finding the right people who can help me. Um, And obviously, I'd never done a licensing deal before. I didn't know even how to design, you know, we designed furniture for houses that we were doing, um, you know, here and there for pieces that were the wrong size or we couldn't find. But to do an entire collection was something completely different. And I can say that I learned a lot on the job, (laughs) really learning, you know, how do you make furniture and how do you do a licensing collection? Interesting. So I'd love to get a sense from all of you. Like Liz, I'll start with you. When you feel overwhelmed, whether creatively or, you know, just because, like, the deliveries are late, as we were saying, what do you do so to get your focus back, to get your creativity back? Are there specific things that you do? Do you take days off? Do you go have a nice meal somewhere? What do you do? Um, I wish I could just cure it with a meal, but, yeah, usually <laughs> I just need, <laughs> I need to check out for a little bit sometimes. Um, I don't do it very often, actually. But I know when I'm craving travel or a beach, that means I'm burning out a little bit. And it's sort of interesting because it's literally happening right now where I was like (laughs) trying to get away. Mm -hmm. I've been honestly all weekend. I was like, where can I fly to? Where can we go for just like four days with nobody? I told my husband, I was like, if you can't come, I'm going by myself. I have to go. (laughs) Anywhere I could get was like raining. So I was like, forget it. Um, Yeah, it's, I just, I do need to take breaks um, in terms of, I need to get away and just sort of clear my head completely. I also like to listen to books, audiobooks. So I don't know, a few weeks ago, I was listening to Danny Meyer's book on, what was it about? Like enlightened hospitality. And so sometimes when I think I listen to like another industry about how they do things, it sparks all these amazing ideas for me that I'm able to apply to my business. And so um, I sometimes will, if I'm not doing creative for a specific project, I will do something internally, you know, either with my staff, um, we'll do an exercise or something that is still creative or sparks creativity in others. And I feel like that helps refuel me. And Raymond, what about you? Are there trigger war- signs or warnings that you say, oh my God, I, I'm like, I don't, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, not implying that you do this, but they're like, I used to find if I was yelling at my staff or something <laughs> and I knew, oh my God, yeah. there's something wrong. Yeah, uh, I don't, I don't really raise my voice, but um, I find that it, I'm easily frustrated or every every week there's something really stressful. So in the mornings I try to meditate before anything starts. So I always get up super early and I spend a lot of time, like maybe like an hour by myself. And I do try to meditate and, and refocus myself, you know, which lasts about 15 minutes once a day starts. But it's better than not meditating at all, for sure. I distract myself a lot when I can't make work happen or things are not going well, then I just always turn to fashion, which is like my favorite thing. And I spend a lot of time on Pinterest looking at clothes or I look at websites or look at clothes a lot. Or if I need to really go out, I'll go shopping down in Soho and just walk around and look in stores, you know, and just not think about work for a while. You know, fashion's definitely been like a security blanket for me. And it helps because it's not on the subject, but it's related to what we did. Right. You know? Right. And it can be very inspiring. Yeah. Right. Also, they say inspiring. even if you just go for a 50 minute walk around the block or something, that helps clear your mind and, and set you yeah. up for. And, you know, what about you? Because I'm sure you have endless emails, endless texts all day long. 
Um, I think for me, I know that I'm having a burnout when I don't do anything, where I'm just looking at my computer and I keep on making several to-do lists, but none of them are getting done. And I'm <laughs> Nothing just gets crossed off. going in circles. Um, and so, and I try to do other things. So it's really interesting, Raymond, because I love looking at clothes too. And so that's my getaway is every time I get frustrated, I pull up, and this is horrible, but I pull up my iPhone and I start looking at like, different, you know, Dolce Gabbana, whatever, whatever is coming up. And I try to refocus my attention somewhere else, but then for sure I get nothing done. So I think that's when I know that it's just not working for me. And I was having that actually two weeks ago. And then I went to Milan and I came back and I'm still having it. <laughs> it never went away. So. <laughs> yeah, but sometimes when you think you're not doing anything, things are percolating in the back of your head. You know, sometimes you have to trust the process. So Liz, what, what do you do? Um, you know, one of the things I, I think it's just chilling out and, and I, I do do the fashion thing. I'm guilty of it. I, my husband makes fun of me. I feel like shopping cart upon shopping cart with like stuff that I just abandon. It's called like the world. My computer is the tabs of abandoned shopping carts, just filled with things that I just like, I don't know. I gotta just, I don't know what to do right now. So I'll just do this. But yeah, I think, um, it's really kind of, I exercise. I mean, I do feel like that helps me clear my head a lot. It's just like I go to boot camp classes or um, I'll do a Pilates session or something, which is sort of, it helps. But um, usually you just need time and trust, trust. I think trusting at this point, knowing that when I need a break, I take a break. You can't push through sometimes when you're just, your head isn't there. So acknowledging that and just sort of leaning into <laughs> your rut is good. <laughs> it's how you get out. <laughs> I agree with Liz. I think you have to get off the subject if you're not getting anywhere. If it's frustrating you and make you unhappy, you have to get off that subject at least for a little while. And then you can go back to it later. Now, here's another aspect of burnout because all of you have teams. Has it ever happened that you really have like um, a staff member, part of one member of your team who's really not? producing who's really they're having their own burnout and how do you handle that Nina how about you I see you're nodding your head yeah it happens it's happened to me several times in the past and you know there's only the thing is is that I understand that they can get burnt out as well but I'm also burnt out so I always try to have a talk with them and let them mm -hmm. know that hey if you need to take a couple of days off then go and come back when you're ready to work because I'm basically wasting payroll on you and I can't charge the client because you're not producing anything and so I try to be very honest with them or I send them out of the office because what happens is when an employee is having burnout, they're actually um, being very negative on the rest of the team. And sometimes it's better to just get them out of the office and then tell them, come back when you're ready. And what about you, Liz? Has that ever happened? Because your team is small. So, I mean, we're so like small. I mean, yeah, we're, we're really small and we're in an open concept office. So, you kind of know like a lot about everybody all the time. So it's tough. I don't know if I've really experienced necessarily a staff member burned out, but I know that they all have sort of different skill sets. Um, so we sort of, one of the things we did is sort of developed like different, um, you know, instead of developing product, I'm, I'm not doing that. And I admire anyone who does it. Um, I sort of, I feel like I'm stuck in this like service place, not stuck. I think I, I like to be there. I sort of, we sort of have this concierge and preservation um, department that we use. And this is sort of where my staff members, when they're burned out, they can work on some of these things. So it's where we're doing like um, styling and just like, you know, it's like light decorating as opposed to like, you know, you know, the fixtures and plumbing schedules and all that kind of stuff that, you know, it gets to be a lot. Sometimes it's not so fun um, until you get, you know, until you get to some of the more, the soft, fun things. And I think that that's sort of a nice, that's a nice outlet for them where they're still being productive for us. Um, and they're able to just do something else and hone their skills because, you know, they're, they're becoming, they're training their eye. They're, you know, working on something and they're working with a client. So those are helpful. So that's sort of what we've found has been helpful. Well, that's cool to have, a, you can shift somebody onto, you know, slightly different aspect of, so yeah. that, you know, it's not as intense, but it allows them to, um, you know, keep busy, keep thinking, being creative, but not yeah. quite with as much stress. And Raymond, have you had the same kind of problem? Yeah, you know, I think what Liz said, just like 
kind of resonated with me because I think we just finished Design on a Dime you right. know, last week, and that's one of the charities that we do every year. And I really think that the staff, we all love it because it's a break from like just doing what other people want you to do and we can do whatever we want and we're giving back and there's a lot yeah, of you fun did a great thing, yeah. tied to it. Thank you. Thank you. Right. No, we but I know it's like, it's, but to take something on like that or like, yeah. you know, somebody comes to you and so we want you to design for Kips Bay or, or, you know, Dallas Show House or whatever. Yeah. It's exciting, but it's more pressure. So yeah, it's how, true. how do you know when to say yes? I think in general, show houses are tricky it's not, it's different. Design on a Dime means a lot to me. I mean, it's a really important charity and Housing Works means a lot to me. And this year I was a co-chair, so I had a lot of responsibilities for recruiting people and like getting donations and things like that. But I'll do it every year if I can, because I feel like it's an important service and they house a lot of people. I, I think that was an easy yes for me and our team, we really like doing it. It's just like, it takes you out of like the stress of the clients and you're just having to please yourself or please me or, or, you know, please Honeyford. But I think we did a good job. Right. But um, you did. I think as far as show houses go, we've done a bunch of them. I think you have to know when to say no. And I think like when you have like several projects going on at the same time, you don't really need to do a show house. So you probably shouldn't do a show house. You know, it can be expensive and it just takes up a lot of time, but it could also be good exposure. I mean, I have no regrets from what I've done show house wise. Definitely the last show house I did in Sag Harbor was brilliant. It, it gave me the opportunity to like really express a different side of myself. So I'm glad I did that, you know. But I think for now, I won't be doing any show houses. <laughs> You're burnt out, so to speak, for the moment. Yeah, for show houses, exactly. How about you, Nina? Because I'm sure, again, you must get requests to do special things, to work to do this. Is it a question of timing? Is it a question of your staff is not ready? How, how do you decide when to say yes and when to say no? Because you don't want to say no all the time. Yeah. You just have great opportunities. I think we have the opposite problem. I think we say yes all the time. <laughs> and so, you know, we did Kips Bay in 2021, and that was the most stressful time I've ever had because we only had, like, what, eight weeks to do the entire right. room and a bathroom and a closet. So we had a few spaces. It was very stressful. Um, and then, obviously, just now in Milan, I did the Artemis show house. And, you know, it's... The thing is, is the exposure that you get is bar to none um, because everyone gets to know you. They see your product. They see your design style. And so there is definitely a plus to it in terms of, I mean, we can't all sit in the office and just design all day long. We have to have a release yeah. of something. And so I think that it's important to have those releases, even though they're stressful, they're a good, they're different from designing in an office and doing CAD plans all day long. It's true. Mm -hmm. And Liz, do you, do you sometimes take on things and you think, oh my God, are, I shouldn't have done this or whatever? But Yeah, we, I mean, I used to do it a lot more than I do it now. Um, but yes, it happens. But I do. we do have conversations about it in the office. The nice part about being a small office is everyone's kind of exposed to everything. So um, I think that's good uh, for, well, maybe it's good, maybe it's bad, but we do <laughs> talk about it a little bit. I mean, ultimately, ultimately I make the decision, but I do... I do want them to see, um, I want everyone to sort of understand like what it takes and I want to hear their input as to like how they're, how they're feeling about things. And we kind of make a lot of decisions as a group. And I think that's, it's nice because I do value their input. Um, and it's, uh, we, we're all, um, you know, at different times of the year, I guess it makes, it makes a difference as to how much you can really handle and how much you want to take on. So yeah. The timing has to be right, too. It's, I mean, if you've got four major projects going on and somebody asks you to do something, you're not going to be able to do it. But, right. But, but yes, it's a, it's, it's a lot. It's, we, we, sometimes we make bad decisions. Sometimes we make really great decisions. Sometimes, uh -huh. you know, we were a little slow for the first couple of months of the year. And, you know, weirdly, I was sort of panicking. But I was kind of panicking internally. Um, but then I never really, like— I think we've always been so busy for the last, like, I don't know, 12, 13 years that I never really thought. I was like, maybe the phone never rings in January and February. We're just working on things. So it was kind of a very weird time. And now, of course, the phone is ringing again. And we are having to make some decisions. Like, what, what can we actually handle? Yeah. yeah. Now, I want to get a sense from each of you. 
I mean, we've been talking about how much work you do and how many outside forces and deliveries. And, you know, we all know from problems with contractors and artisans that are so backed up and too busy. But do you ever have, like, a creative crisis, a creative where you, you come to a project and you just think, oh, this is a great apartment. I, ha- I don't have an idea what to do here. I'm just, you know, creatively <laughs> dead. Has that ever happened to any of you? Mm-hmm. Um, uh-huh. Nina, what about you? Yes, it has happened to me, and it actually and, just recently happened to me. Oh. <laughs> totally. So what do you do? You panic? Laughing. You just panic? No, or? no, we don't panic. I know okay. it always comes to me, so I have to go back. Obviously, I get on Pinterest. I look mm-hmm. at magazines, and then all of a sudden, it all starts coming to me. You know, okay. um, I think that we do this so long, every single day for so many years, that it happens a lot, actually. I, there's never, I don't think there's ever been one time that I've gone into a space and said, you know, there's the light bulb. That's exactly what I'm doing. Never. I think oh. always it's a little bit <laughs> wow. of a process. I always have to think about it and then, you know, strategically think, okay, what do I really want to do? Wow. I think that's going to be very reassuring to a lot of our listeners. <laughs> what about what about you, Raymond? Has that ever happened? Yeah, you just think I'm kind of brain dead? I don't know what to do. <laughs> doesn't happen to me. I kind of always know. Uh-huh. If, if it's a project and I don't know what to do with it, then it's probably a project I'm not going to take. Right. You know, I always but that's have the some, other option to say this is not right for me. Right. I always have some idea. And sometimes there's a lot of money involved with certain projects, especially like commercial projects. So mm-hmm. there is a little bit of a like, oh, I don't know what to do. That's not derivative. You know, I want to think of something different. But then I would stall. You know, but in general, I'm usually inspired by the client. Or I'm, I'm inspired by the space, the location of the neighborhood. And so I have some like specific ideas of something that I want to try. I um I could see it happening where I'd get burned out on something or I could see if I have to do something I don't want to do, then it would be really hard for me to be creative, you know. But in general, I don't think it's ever happened that I had no idea what to do. It just never happens to me. So you have faith moving ahead. This is, this is. Well, faith is one way of putting it. I think what I have is I have a lot of fantasies and ideas in my head of things that I want to achieve. And sometimes they're not a good fit for every client. But, like, the universe always is trying to give you what you want. So a client will always come along that will be the fit for the thing. I'm just like, I've always wanted to do stuff with purple. And everybody I, that I meet hates purple. But I had three <laughs> clients who love purple in the past year. So Well, there you, you go. Know, wow. I got That's to do a lot faith. of purple stuff. <laughs> and That's I've been really great. happy about that. I like That's, purple. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> That's great. And Liz, Liz, what about you? I mean, is there, has there ever been a case where you just, you know, let's say you accept to do this project, this house or whatever. It's a perfectly nice house. And you just think, I, I don't know where to begin. Um, yeah, actually, I feel like it sort of is happening right now. <laughs> it's oh. kind of a thing. And Why do I keep feeling I'm hitting nerves? I know. You know? The timing of this is amazing. Um, yeah, it's kind of weird. I I feel like I am always inspired by the client or the architecture or the location. There's always something. So I always usually have, I get so excited. I have an idea and I don't know. I I think I need to spend more time with this client because I'm not sure I'm really understanding them. And then when you sort of look, you know, at the first glance of what's been there and, you know, usually you get a lot of clues. Like I didn't get any, I was like, I don't, I don't know what's happening. This is very, so there's just like, um, you know, it was like all these, I, I want to say it's like all these frequencies sort of that weren't, nothing was sticking. It was very static. Everything was moving around. And I feel like this project is, um, it is challenging me right now, but I, it, it'll, it'll come. It always comes. We usually start with, you know, some sort of a narrative that we, you know, we kind of write internally that sort of helps us kind of get the story. So I just have to like figure out what the story is, but um, it starts with the client. Yeah. And so, yeah. We need to have another date. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, let's face it, like clients, like everybody else, some people are more forthcoming than others. Some people are more expressive, and yeah. some people are just more yeah. closed yeah. in, you know? So, yeah, I, I'd say that sometimes the client turns out not to be the right fit. You know, well, like that's you think you have your too. idea, but the client doesn't like that that brilliant idea that I have, and it makes it hard to move forward because you can't really, well, I don't want to compromise. <laughs> Do you know what I right. mean? Right. Well, you had mentioned that before, Raymond, that sometimes if they don't yeah. like your first your best ideas, your first couple of best ideas, how far down the road of, of yeah. compromise do you want to go? You know, yeah, which and is I a guess good that, question. Yeah. That is a good question. I think we were just talking about that in the office today about how 
I said, I don't, I don't want to take jobs that we have to compromise too much on anymore necessarily. I just feel like it's not, it's not helping us. It's not helping anybody. And it doesn't mean that we want to be, you know, it doesn't mean that we're being heavy handed and we don't want to work with a client. I think it's sort of more right. setting the project up from the beginning and managing expectations in terms of just, you know, the project side, the business side. And the creative yeah. side, right? And like, these are the things we believe in and these are our values and this is what we're going to do. And I, I don't want to do that. Like maybe you, maybe you saw, I, I did that 10 years ago. I, I'm not doing, we're not doing that anymore. We've evolved. So um, having those conversations are not easy, but uh, I think they pay off. Right. Good for well, you. Yeah. And it's not, not about being dictatorial. It's just like, are, are we on the same page here? Yeah. And yes, you're flexible, but you're not going to betray your creativity because that's a, another kind of creative crisis is when somebody is not in sync with your idea of creativity, then they're not the right client for you. Has that ever happened to you, Nina? Yeah, you know, I think that from our point of view, I mean, I have a little bit of a different point of view. We have a little bit of a larger firm. And so, you know, when you have a client who's paying you half a million dollars in design fees, you know, you have to hear what the client wants. And sometimes, well, yes, that's and sometimes true. we do have to compromise on certain things right. because we are running a business. <laughs> right. And the yeah. client wants something. But they and wouldn't you've got have, that nut to every yeah. month. You've got to dish out that money. Exactly. And we wouldn't have taken on the problem. Project. Like, for instance, we don't touch traditional projects at all. Right. So if a client comes in and says, I have a traditional house, we probably won't touch it. And we'll just right. say we're probably not the right fit for right. you. But we go through a screening process at the very beginning to, you know, from the beginning to understand, do we want to take on this client? Can we do them right. a disservice or a service? What happens sometimes, though, like for me, I'm kind of known for color and people see something in a magazine and they say, I really want you to push me with color. But then once we get hired, they don't really want to be pushed that far. Yeah. And it becomes like a thing where it's like, well, you said you wanted color, but you don't really, do you? Totally. You know? <laughs> I understand. Yeah. I get it. <laughs> well, the problem, too, is people don't know themselves, you know? Yeah. They, they don't understand. I mean, if somebody says, I'm a beige person then they're not the right client for you. But if somebody no. thinks they're a color person and they're really a beige person and that happens, God knows, that's where it's, it gets hard. So, but um, I think you're right. I don't think people know because some people come to us and they say, we're modern transitional. And then they show us pictures and we're like, this is very traditional. But right. yeah. just, their understanding is totally different. Right. You know? That's so, so true. That's yeah. really true. Yeah. We have someone who was like, I want maximal. And we showed them maximal, you know, maximal to me is, you know, wall coverings, draperies, right. pattern on pattern, right. like bright things. Yeah. You know, they wanted maximal and colorful. And they showed us their inspiration images and it was like white walls and a colorful <laughs> pillow. There was one pillow. And I was like, yeah. that's actually not maximal. So like, let's, <laughs> let's like, let's get our vocabulary down, both of us. Yeah. So that uh, we're, uh, yeah. No. But I was like, oh. it's, it's that language that, you know. People, these words are very broad. You know, what's contemporary yeah. to some person is not contemporary to another person. What does right. that mean, contemporary? What's transitional? It's everything. Transitional, yeah. What does that mean? <laughs> yeah. You know? So, so Raymond, funny. someone's bringing you pink and they're saying it's purple. What are you going to do? <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> take it. Take it and run with it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Make it lavender. You yeah. Know? yeah. It's very funny. So, okay, I, I just would like to get a sense from each of you what would be your best piece of advice to a designer who's probably not as experienced as you guys? We have a lot of young designers who listen in. When they're they're starting to burn out, when they're they're getting frazzed, they they're not thinking straight. You know, they're having problems with their staff, their team, their their deliveries. What would be your best piece of advice to that designer, Raymond? Why do we start with you? Well. I think when you are in a situation where you're frustrated, and this applies to anything in life, and it feels like you're just paddling upstream and you're not getting anywhere, I think it's the time that you have to let go of the oars. So you let yourself go downstream, you take a break, you do something else, you go for a walk. I remember I used to work in a retail job. I worked in retail for like years and years and years, and I worked in this job that I hated. and. And if I got really frustrated with the customers, I'd just like walk out, walk around the block, like you said, and then come back and feel a little bit better. You know, there's no like instant fix for these kind of frustrating situations. And if you're young and new and you're starting out, you need to like really pace yourself. So I'd say don't give up 
on design to this young new person, but like, you know, take a break, let go of the oars and let yourself like focus on something else for a while and then come back to it. Right. Great advice. Nina, what about you? Yeah, I would say, you know, go travel, walk out of the office yeah. um, because there's no good staying in the office. Like, for instance, I'm a micromanager and I know it's horrible and I'm trying That's really hard. That's horrible, Nina. <laughs> I, know. Yeah. I know, I'm trying really hard to get better. But, you know, it's just sometimes I get very frustrated and I just, I, I have to leave. I just leave. Before I used to try to keep on trying to work it out. And all that does is cause frustration to them, to me. It creates an unhealthy environment. And so right. it's better to just walk out. Right. <laughs> right. And, you know, the other thing that is flip side of that is sometimes you have to realize that this person that you're having this frustration with is not the right person for the job. You know, and some, I mean, it's a horrible thing to have to fire somebody or let them go. But sometimes it's a blessing to everybody, including the rest of your team and yourself. You know, yeah. I mean, I I used to stress out like crazy when I knew something wasn't working, and I probably have to find, it, sleepless nights. You know, and then it was always a relief to the person because if you're in the wrong job, you know it somewhere mm-hmm. subconsciously, and you're not happy. Mm-hmm. You know, so yeah. anyway, that's my Very little true. extra bit of advice. Mm-hmm. Liz, what about you? What would you say to somebody who's like confronting? The edge of burnout, frazzle, frazzle, dazzle here. They're, they don't know what to do. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I guess I would say time is on your side. It's your friend. So um, let it pass. Just let time pass. I think that's helpful. But Or like find a rabbit hole, you know, something that you can like do a deep dive that has nothing to do with work. You know, so fashion, travel, learn about something and just kind of do a bit, go to a museum. Sometimes if you just like go to a museum and look around, like, it's so low pressure. Like you, you don't have to do yeah. anything, and you can enjoy beauty, and yeah. it's inspiring. I find that endlessly inspiring to go yeah. to go to museums. It's like really finds it's great for yeah. recharging myself. I agree. I agree. Well, you know, I want to thank you guys. This has been so interesting and so helpful. I know our listeners are going to get a lot out of this. So I want to thank my wonderful guests, Liz Kahn, Nina Megan, and Raymond Boozer, and thank you all for listening.